and you hardly saw him or grandma without the other one. Uh, he was a bit of a goof, as grandma said, never shut up. Uh, but he was also very attentive and meticulous, uh, always writing notes and dates in his pocketbook. We called it his computer. Uh, he never actually had a real computer or even internet for that matter, or GPS. Um, he would also write notes on the brochures and newsletters of many of the church missionary families from peoples uh, so he could stay updated and pray for them. He was a prayer warrior and a godly man, and a few of us just wanted to share some of his favorite passages today. So the first passage is very familiar, yet very impactful, and it actually started Grandpa on his long and faithful walk with Jesus. So that is John 3:16 through 18. For God to love the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Eternal life through Jesus is what we know Grandpa has now, and that is comforting and exciting, as sad as it might be. Another favorite passage of Grandpa's was Hebrews 4, 15, and 16. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. This passage is one of Grandpa's favorites because it assures us that we can come boldly to the throne of God and that he understands our weaknesses. It's very special to be able to share these passages with all of Grandpa's friends and family here today, and I know that this is what he would have wanted us to all reflect on together. Hello everyone, my name is Dale, and this is my wife Amy, granddaughter of Papa, and uh, the aforementioned great-granddaughter is our daughter Sylvie. Um, I'll be reading one of Papa's favorite passages from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 21, and uh, Papa said he just loved this passage um, as it demonstrates God's great love, and those of us who know Papa well know that he was a very loving man and a great inspiration, the godly life he lived. So starting in verse 14, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, forever and ever. Amen. I'm up next. My name is Ben. Um, Greg and Beth's son here. Hope I can find my place. Could have bookmarked it, but hey, I didn't uh, think that far ahead. I wanted to start saying Grandma and Papa wrote me little notes all the time uh, when I was away at school in Kingston. And um, Grandma didn't let Papa write on the same card. She thought it would uh, mess up kind of her pretty little card so he would always just have kind of a notepad with his scribblings and uh, this was certainly one of the verses that he mentioned um, and it was always kind of mentioning who God is um, big words he said God is faithful God is just right um, he's gracious and he is good I'm gonna read Psalm 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
which he is, and it's encouraging to me um, that Papa found comfort in, in a verse like this, and despite all that he went through, um, he clung to Jesus, and he always told me to stay close with Jesus um, and trust in God, and that's a passage that I'll remember because of Papa. Firstly, thank you everyone for attending. Amy set up a book called Papa, Tell Me Your Story, 101 Questions for Papa to Share His Life and His Thoughts. This is an amazing keepsake to look back on and to reflect on Papa, so thank you, Amy, for doing that. I wanted to read a section of the book for you titled, How Do You Want to Be Remembered? In Papa's own words, he writes, a loving, compassionate, honest, faithful servant, a humble, patient, gracious, giving husband and father. To God be the glory. I didn't hear anything about grandfather, but he was incredible. I am beyond blessed. Papa loved his family unconditionally and prayed for us daily. He is an ideal role model and person to look up to. If you asked anyone, they would describe Papa with a few of these characteristics that he wanted to live by. I am very blessed and thankful to have Papa as my grandfather and that he raised my father so well. And I have a pretty awesome uncle too. Shout out to my dad and Uncle Steve. Life has taught me so far that no matter what you face and no matter what happens, family will always be there. And family is very important. So thank you, God, for putting me into this family. And thank you for Papa. Well done. It's not easy to uh, stand up uh, in front of folks uh, and to be able to share from your heart on a, on a stressful day where you're remembering and the loss of a grandpa. So thank you. Well done. Well said. You know, there's some uh, really unique things uh, and themes that are going to come through our time as we uh, reflect on uh, Mr. Medill. And, uh, you know, some of those are his, his, his ability to give. He, he, he wasn't afraid to do stuff behind the scenes. He was a servant. And uh, the things that he did was for the glory of God. And so uh, really appreciate the things that uh, the grandkids have said. And his faith, may his faith become each one of our faiths as we go forward. And uh, just so thankful for that. Thinking about the grandkids and... and uh, Bill's life, uh, it is not often in our lives that we hang together with someone, well, for 60 years, that's, that's pretty amazing. Uh, but we have someone here today that has known Mr. Medill uh, for 75 years. In fact, if I am correct, they, they went to public school or elementary school together. In fact, they came over on the boat together. I think it was the boat they came over on. <laughs> long, long time ago. But uh, that's, uh, that, those are amazing feats. And then to still have that best friend with you uh, to this day is pretty amazing. But uh, we're going to call on Raymond Stuthers to come and uh, just share uh, from his heart uh, things that uh, maybe some of us don't know about Bill, but, uh, but he's here. Please come. Thank you, Raymond. It's a privilege. Thank you for the opportunity. Greg, you took a lot of my thunder away. <laughs> the 75 years, minimum. Yeah, so that's right. I've known Bill, excuse me, Willie. <laughs> you can't hear. <clears throat> Jean, can you hear me now? That's better. 
Thank you. <laughs> okay. Bill, as you know him, is Willie Medell. Okay, that's who I knew, who I grew up with, Willie Medell. In Portadown, Northern Ireland. Okay. We did go to primary school together. I have some notes because uh, unlike Willie Medell, I can't remember very much. He has a memory which was incredible, absolutely incredible, you know. But we did, we did grow up together, went to primary school together, you know. But his memory is incredible. And about two or three weeks ago, I was speaking to him on the phone and talking about some of the old days, and he could, he could fill me in on names, the times of what of some of the things we were doing, and uh, I was just so glad that he could remind me. Um, cycling was a big thing in our lives, and as I'm talking to him a few weeks ago, I said, "Bill, uh, Bill, okay, <laughs> so, Bill." Do you remember the time that uh, we went cycling and being in Northern Ireland, we would go through the Mourne Mountains and end eventually up at, the, up at the sea? He says, indeed. He says, you remember the time we came in, it's called Hillstown. We were coming down the hill around the corner. We were going too fast. And there were about three or four of us went right through the hedge, off the road, right through the hedge, bikes and all. <laughs> And I said, I, I'd forgotten about that wee incident, you know. The one I could remember was, I said, do you remember when we uh, decided to go to Port Rush? Port Rush, uh, there, every year there's a motorbike race in Port Rush. So we decided we were, going to, we were going to cycle to Port Rush. So we started out on our bikes. Uh, there was two or th by three or four of us on our way from Portadown towards Belfast and then make a left up to, it's about 80 miles. Along the one road, Bill took a cramp in his leg and he couldn't cycle any further. He, sa he said to me, he says, I sat down on the side of the road. He said, I couldn't move. So three of our friends that, that we knew what belonged to the bicycle club in, in town, they came along. So they said, not a problem. Let's, we were going up, they were going up to the same way. Let's get together and when we come to a hill, I'll push Bill, and he did. He, right behind us, when we come, came to a hill, he got behind him and pushed him up the hill, okay? About halfway up, we knew of a farm where we could stop at for the night because other friends had done the same thing. So we did. We stopped at the farm and spoke to the farmer, and he said, sure, come on in. And he showed us into a big barn uh, that we went there. The barn was right over the piggery. We could hear the pigs down below there. That's where we spent the night, okay? I think we slept in our uh, duffel bag. Duffel, we had duffel coats. We were really with it in those days, you know? <laughs> we had our duffel coats, and we slept in our duffel coats. So the next morning, the next morning, the farmer came with cups of tea for us, and we got on our bikes and finished our trip up to, to Port Rush, watched the, the motorbike race, and then cycled back down, down home again. As I said, cycling was a, a big part of our lives, and frequently we would cycle from Port Adown to Newcastle, which is on the coast. It's about around the coast, about 50 miles, and, and it would, we would have our swimming pants trunks with us and our coats. We would have a dip in the Irish Sea, and believe me, we thought we were having fun, but it was really, <laughs> it was really, after you've been to the Caribbean and we just came back from, uh, from Cuba, it was no fun, but we didn't realize that, you know? <laughs> so we had, what we would do, we would have our trip around Newcastle, have our dip, go, head back to, back to Portadown, and that night we would go to the Eden Dairy Church in Portadown, okay? There was a fellowship there every night at, at 10, about 
the night, eight o'clock or whatever, but we, we were in time after our trip to go to, to the church. That's the same church at a special crusade that Bill and I together came forward to, to be with our Lord. That's a commitment that Bill has kept faithfully for the rest of his life in which he has passed on to both of their sons and families. And I've heard, and it's such a, a pleasure to know exactly what you're saying, because that was your dad and your, grand, your grandpa. Anyway, uh, he, Bill's memories, by the way, are they live on. Even though Bill has passed on, the memories continue to live. Those memories are with us forever, you know. Anyway, uh, when we're about 20, when we were 21, actually we had our 21st birthday. Bill was, as uh, Greg had said, his birthday was in, in May, mine's September. So we're both the, pretty well exactly the same age, you know. So when we were about 21, we decided to go to Canada, big adventure. We decided we'd go for two or three years. I think we've surpassed that, you know? <laughs> but it was a, a big adventure. That's what we wanted to do. We wanted for a big adventure. There were about four or five of us in our little coffee group that we decided we'd go, but Bill and I were the only two that followed through with it, okay? So we departed to sail to Canada, and I have it here because my memory's, you know, on May the 20th, 1959. It took five days to cross over to eventually come up the estuary to Montreal. Five days. In my memory serves me right, I think we were sick, four of them. I mean, seasick. It was an experience, you know. So we arrived in Montreal, took the tra had a train up to Toronto, and an aunt that I had never met before met us at the at this train station. And we stayed with her for about five days to get oriented where we were. I remember going down to the employment center shortly after we had arrived to apply for a job because we knew we needed to get some money. Bill got a job almost right away. He had just been qualified as a, as we would here would say a tool and die maker. In Ireland, he was a fitter in a, in a, fin a linen factory, served his time and had just completed his time whenever we decided, let's have the big adventure, let's go to Canada for two or three years. I think that was the one job he kept for most, most of his life, that one same company. Me, I didn't get a job quite so quickly. I had to go to, to Bay Street and knock on doors. Eventually ended up uh, going to work at Eaton's which uh, the word was, if you came from Northern Ireland, Timothy Eaton guaranteed you a job. That's right, I worked there for quite a while, you know. Anyway, um, I just wanted to say that Bill's big adventure, his next big adventure has begun. Let's look on it that way. Billy Graham once said, one day you will hear that I am dead. I will never be more alive. And then also I will say, remember, and I mentioned to Gene when we were together before he passed, remember Gene, this is only a temporary situation. He'll be waiting for us again. Thank you. I don't I like them so much. A family of giants. <laughs> <laughs>
Good morning. I am Steve's wife, Denise, and I'm actually going to speak on behalf of Stephen and Jean and, and our family. The first thing I want to say is you grandchildren did such an amazing job. I'm so proud of all of you. You did a really great job. Thank you so much. Um, I, also, I also love that it was such a consistent um, throughout, like Bill was who we knew, and he was that to all of us. Um, and, and that just really um, was visible as the grandkids were speaking. Um, thank you so much for being here, everybody. I, it's amazing to me to have been able to see some of the faces that I've been able to see, and we really appreciate it. And I also want to give a special thank you. We are actually streaming this, and a special thank you to our family in, in back home um, that are able to join us as well. I think that's so special. You know, Bill was a strong, I, I'm going to need to read this, so forgive me. Bill was a strong, faithful man that always put God first in his life. He loved his wife dearly, and his family was the most important thing to him. He was an exemplary role model to his sons, um, first in his faith, then as a loving, committed husband, and then in his service to Christ, from being a part of the Boys Brigade, church, the program at church, to being an elder in the church, to being an usher as well. He even got up on the platform at People's Church to perform a little jig for the Christmas program. <laughs> he tithed faithfully and was very generous in his financial support. I just lost my place here. Um, in his financial support of several ministries. He loved soccer, and he taught his boys how to play when they were young. He coached their teams as well when they were young. Um, Saturday mornings, we all knew that he was, you know, going to the UK to watch the matches. So we kind of left him until the afternoon, and then we could communicate with him. He was devoted to and protective of his wife, with whom he shared 60 years of marriage. Bill worked hard so that Jean could be home with the boys, and when she eventually did go to work, she was able to work part-time only and still be available to her family. He was supportive and generous to his sons and their families, making sure that he saw them often. Um, I, I've recently um, been able to spend a, a lot of time there because they did come up to Barry um, and lived so close to us. So I've been able to have some really great conversations with Bill and Jean. And when I recently asked him if there was anything that he would like, he said for all of his grandchildren to know Jesus. When I asked him what his favorite verse was, he said all of them. <laughs> so I'm so glad that Amy was able to break it down a little bit for us. Um, and when I asked if there was anything that he still wanted to do, he said to serve more. He will be greatly missed here, but we know that he's rejoicing in heaven with his Lord and Savior. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm not looking up, because that's not going to work very well. Okay, like, you've, uh, like you've heard already, my daughter Amy had dad fill out a little book a few years ago answering questions about his life, titled, Papa, Tell Me Your Story. Whew. So glad she did. One thing that stood out to me was the fact that dad's parents always made sure that dad had good friends, the friends that my dad had. For an example to me, that I too should surround myself with good friends. And it's obvious looking around today that we do indeed have amazing friends surrounding us today and loving us and doing life together. Special thank you to Steve and Denise. They have done the lion's share of care for mom and dad, taking them to appointments and making sure they had the right medical care, their care at home, bringing them and moving them up to Barry, taking them to church and many, many other countless hours of housekeeping and home services. Thanks guys. <laughs> Special shout out to Tyler too. He was so kind enough to visit dad regularly and still drops in to see mom very often. I'm so thankful that God has placed me into this Medill family. I was always supported, always loved, cared for, encouraged, prayed for, 
and disciplined when needed. <laughs> Dad was an excellent example on how to give. I don't remember an offering plate ever going by him without him putting something in it. He taught me how to tithe, but also how to give over and above. His heart's desire was missions. And even in the final days, he had mom writing checks to mission organizations. Dad loved his boys. He was so proud of us. I'm not sure why at times, because we certainly weren't perfect. He said that his dad was kind, but firm. And that's how my dad was too. And I'm thankful for there's a section in a booklet that asks his happiest moments of life. He states, praise God, I've been blessed with many. His loving parents, his three dear sisters, many great friends. He mentions Jimmy Greenwood and meeting Jimmy, who became like a father to Steve and I. And Julia, we love you. We thank you for your generosity and love all these years. It was great to see George and Diane Hybron. Sorry, but it's not reg. It was great to see George and Diane Hybron and Raymond and May Stuthers, great friends, visiting them in hospice. Back to Dad's happiest moments. Dad mentions Steve and Denise, Beth and myself. He then mentions all the grandchildren by name, Amy, Cassie, Tyler, Ben and Matt. He loved you guys and prayed for you daily. Now this book was written about four years ago, so I do apologize to Dale and Sylvie. <laughs> but let's not kid ourselves, we all know that Sylvie has moved up to the top of Dad's favorite list. Another uh, question and message there. He'd say, what would you like to share with your family? And he writes, don't try to face life's troubles alone. God is in control. Seek God first. Depend on him. Above all else, walk with Jesus. Go in God's strength. He knows the way. Stay close to Jesus. Feed on God's word and know right from wrong. He loved his wife. Amy asks, how did you meet my grandmother? We met at an Irish picnic up at Sybil's Point on Lake, Lake Simcoe. He says, at lunch, we lined up at a food truck. I ordered a Western sandwich. A good-looking girl in line about two or three behind me asked, what's a Western? So Dad explained the ingredients. Oh, lovely. I'll have one of those. <laughs> he says, when I came out to cash out, he tells the lady in the blue sweater, she'll pay for everything. <laughs> Well, that young lady, that pretty young lady went crazy. She says, no way, I'm not paying. <laughs> and I knew right away, that's my wife. <laughs> Dad says mom asked her, asked, mom, bleh. Dad says mom asked him to marry her. <laughs> and with exclamation, he says three times. I'm not sure how true this part is, but apparently she asked, how would you like your washing hanging on the same line as mine? <laughs> His love and concern for my mom was incredible. He loved her. <sighs> he loved her and he protected her. And even when he was in unbearable pain, I asked, you want to go to the hospital? And there's his first question and concern was, 
What about your mother? Another question was, was there a defining moment that helped you grow into the person you are today? A defining moment, and he answers boldly and confidently, when I received Jesus Christ as my Savior. i got to repeat that. His defining moment, accepting Christ. He says, I'm still growing today, trusting, serving, as the Holy Spirit guides me to keep praying, reading the Bible, asking, listening, seeking, always learning about God's plans and promises. Two promises he states, I am with you always, and I will never leave you or forsake you. And at the bottom of the page he writes, thank you, Lord. I had the privilege of reading these pages and many more to him in his final days. Ah, brutal, I just got a text. It might help me, though. Anyway, I had the privilege of reading these pages and many more to him in his final days. He had favorite verses. We read them aloud. His eye would open wider. His eyebrow would lift up. His lip would move. And we would love to have heard him and hear what he had to say. The last question I'll leave you was with, and Matt went over it. I'm just going to repeat it. Papa, how do you want to be remembered? He said, a loving, compassionate, honest, faithful servant, a humble, patient, gracious, giving husband and father. And he ends with, to God be the glory. Well done, Dad. Well done. Thank you. Well done. You spoke well of a, of a dad, and uh, he's well remembered. If you're able, would you uh, stand with me one more time before I get into my long sermon uh, and sing with me, Great is Thy Faithfulness. is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies I see all I have needed thy hand hath provided great is thy faithfulness Lord Pardon for sin and the peace that endureth. Thine only presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you. Thank you, Julie, again for that.
Wonderful. Well, I just have a, a few uh, words. I, uh, I'm a short person, and I do short things. So uh, we're going to have a, a short little word here. You know, it's at times like these that we're, we, we're caused to ask questions. And one of the questions I'm sure that uh, we ask at these kinds of times, but other times in our lives, and we ask the question, why? 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 I want you to know that uh, you're not alone in asking that question. It's not a bad thing to ask questions. We're human. We want to know. We want to understand. We want to look at a bigger picture. That's why we ask that question. Why? And we're not alone. Now, all of us have asked that question uh, down through the ages, recorded in Scripture. Uh, Moses asked the question, Lord, why have you brought trouble on this people? He asked. Gideon, that great warrior, said, why has all this happened to us? Naomi, who was going to connect herself with Ruth as she was coming back from her exodus into Moab, returning back into Israel, she says, I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why? Why did he do this? Well, we know that she really wasn't empty and she wasn't alone. She had Ruth and there was a great story to be told there. Nehemiah says, why is the Lord's house forsaken? Job went on to say, why have you set me up as your target? You know, and sometimes the things that happen to us, we kind of sense, God, like, why are you sending this stuff my way? I, I feel like there's a target on my back. Why? David said, Lord, why have you cast off my soul? Why did you hide your face from me? Why? Jeremiah said, why is my pain perpetual and my wound incurable? And I'm sure in the last days and years that uh, Bill lived, I, I'm sure he must have wondered, why, why do I have this pain? Constant, always there, perpetual. Why? Why? You know who else asked that question? Very interesting. While Jesus Christ was on the cross, some of the last words out of his mouth was in the form of a question. And he said this, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So it's not wrong for us to ask that question. But it hopefully, inevitably, leads us to look to our Savior, look to our Lord, and say, God, I don't know why, but I know that your faithfulness is great, that you have great love for me, and I can trust you. Many of us are willing to trust the Lord for our eternal life. That, that's a big deal. That's a big thing. That, that's a long time. And if we can trust him for our eternity, we could trust him for today and the things that we're going through because he is trustworthy and because he is faithful. What seems to us like tragedy or an accident or something that caught God off by surprise, actually from his perspective right now when, when we think of Bill and uh, with the passing of his life, uh, Really, he's just asleep. He's not here. But from God's perspective, here are a couple of things for us to consider. He's got his promotion. Uh, those of us that uh, attend People's Church, through our history, we, we, we look a lot about death as kind of a graduation. And, uh, and that's a good thing. He's been promoted, and he's happy with that promotion. He's been released from the burdens of earth. Yeah, there were some burdens, there were some difficulties. And we all, I think, uh, to some degree, greater or, or less, feel that. But it's a release from the burdens. 
It's early retirement or early furlough from the battle zone. His battle's over. He, he's already finished. Relocation to a better climate. <laughs> There's a good one. We don't often think about that probably too much. We think about the climate and, uh, you know, concerns about climate and what's happening with our climate. But uh, he's in a place where there's no night, only sun, only warmth. Instant transportation to the celestial city. Boom. You know, the moment that he passed, he passed from here and instantly he was face to face with the Lord that he loved to serve. To be departed is to be with Christ, which is far better. It's far better. It's far better off. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And while the Lord is with us in the things that we go through day by day, Bill could say, I'm now with the Lord. He's there. He's there. We're thankful that he's there. Our friend has beaten us to heaven and is more alive, as has already been said. He's more alive than he ever was living here. For God is not a God of the dead. He's a God of the living. He's a God of the living. We don't understand all of God's purposes, but we do know that he does all things well. And that was the passage of scripture I guess I was thinking about that comes out of Mark. Early in Jesus' ministry, the disciples were off with him and they'd seen him heal a blind person. He'd healed someone who was lame. He'd healed someone who uh, was filled with some evil spirits. And, and at the end of those instances, those events, the disciples, while they were together, said, you know, we don't understand. It's amazing the things that he's doing. He's amazed us. It's astonishing. And we don't understand all these things, but we do know that he does all things well. All things well. There's no untimely deaths, no untimely trials and temptations and difficulties and aches and pains that uh, as we get older seem to come uh, more and more to us. But it's good for us to stop and to consider God, our Father, Jesus Christ, our Savior. They're working in tandem and they do all things well. Let's pray together. Father, it's at times like this where we're forced to stop the busyness of our lives. And, and, and we're face to face with something that we can't control. But we're reminded in times like this that you love us. Jesus loves me, this I know. We're reminded of your goodness towards us in drawing friends and supporters around us. We're reminded of your goodness. We're reminded of the purposes that you have, purposes that are for good in each one of our lives. You have only our best interest ever in mind, and you do all things well. Father, over these days, we rehearse this over and over again. We don't understand and we don't have all the answers for the why. But we do know and we can trust you that you do all things well. So, Father, our hearts and our minds move towards the family. We pray that you would continue in these days to sustain them, particularly Jean. Father, guide and bless and encourage her. Bring her memories uh, constantly back to her of, of Bill and the family and, and of your goodness and of the way that you do all things well. Father, we're so thankful for family. We're so thankful for Bill and the way that he thought about his family, the way that he loved his family, the way that he cared for his family. Wonderful testimony. 
And that may, may, may that be an encouragement to us and the things that we do to think about our family, to think about our loved ones, to think about our friends and the way that we can serve and encourage one another. Father, your goodness is great. Your faithfulness is real and it's true. And we're so thankful that we can commit our lives once again to you and we can commit this family to you and know that you will not leave them, you will not forsake them, you're with them and they will sense and know your abiding presence through this particular storm and to the ones that are still to come. We're so thankful that you're faithful. We're so thankful that towards the end of his life, Bill could say, it is well with my soul. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, that... Uh, is a wonderful song and it's a wonderful thought. It is well with my soul. And uh, you have those words, I think, uh, on your song sheet. If you would stand one more time with me and uh, we're going to sing this song. And uh, thankful for this promise that it is well with our souls. Let's sing together. Please remain standing and uh, we'll have a closing benediction. Let's pray together. Father, we acknowledge that uh, we are nothing without you. And as Bill discovered, with you is everything, life itself. And Father, uh, we thank you for his testimony. We thank you for who he was and who he continues to be. And Father, may his memory and courage each of us, to draw close to you and allow your Holy Spirit to live through us and in us and all the things that we do. 
that people might see Jesus Christ in us. And those characteristics that Bill showed forth as he honored the person that he loved and adored. May that be true in our lives as well. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and lift up his countenance unto you and give you peace in these days. For Jesus' sake. Amen. 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 Thank you. Daniel. Ladies and gentlemen, this is now coming to the completion of the service here today for Bell. Uh, in just a few short minutes, I'll be asking for the assistance of the pallbearers just to meet me at the side doors just for some instructions. And there's going to be a private family moment just when we recess with the casket out to the side doors and going to the coach with the pallbearers. At that time, I'll just ask all the guests here today just remain inside the pews. It'll only take a moment, so once we're done, we'll recess back inside, make our way down uh, the center aisle, followed by the pews and all the guests here today to go downstairs to share some more memories and stories. Just want to make one other note. Downstairs, right by the staircase inside a little vestibule, there's a desk and chair set up and it has a memory jar there. If there's anyone here today that has a nice memory or a thought or a phrase that you'd like to write down on a piece of paper, you can place that inside the jar and that's something that the family can uh, reflect on afterwards. So it's a nice gesture if you have the moment to please do so. I'll ask that everyone to please remain rising and I'll ask for the pallbearers now at this time. <laughs> 